um, like what is the job and what kind of income would you get from your job? So maybe then, um, after I do the intro, um, yeah. maybe that would be a good time to answer those questions. Okay, okay. good. All right, let's start. All right, hello everyone. Uh, it is time to begin our session here with Dr. Ed. So let me give you a little bit of an introduction of him. Dr. Ed is an internationally recognized keynote speaker and advocate, global ed tech leader. His PhD specialized in user experience and artificial intelligence, UX and AI. Videos of Dr. Ed's work went viral when YouTube just started in 2005, where he saw firsthand the power of AI to influence media and politics. He founded AI Parenting to help families regain control of their relationships, mental health, and career prospects by learning AI systems, financial, and political motivations. Dr. Ed has over 15 years of experience in education and technology, including three successful mergers and acquisitions. Dr. Ed's story of creativity captivates audiences with future-proof skills that cannot be replaced by automation. Dr. Ed was the founding school council chair of the largest online school in Alberta with over 5,600 students. And with that, I will leave you in the capable hands of Dr. Ed. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Ed, and I'm just a geek kid who has shown a little bit of forgiveness by my grade 7 uh, French teacher. Um, you see, like when I went to school, uh, my bullies were not only the other students, uh, they were also my teachers. Uh, my grade one teacher had put me in detention for not knowing that moving a puzzle piece with my middle finger was a bad thing to do. <laughs> my grade four teacher made fun of me in front of the class for fidgeting, and it made me feel so dumb. By grade seven, in late French immersion, I already felt behind without having to learn another language. I felt like I had no choice but to cheat on my French language arts tests. And of course, one day the gig was up and I got caught red-handed. And when it came time for the parent-teacher interview, I knew I was done for. Uh, in French, we say, je suis fini. A uh, suspension would have been the right thing to do. But you know what Monsieur Belanger said to my parents? It changed my life forever. Do you want to hear what he said? You can put it in the chat if you are able to, or you can ask a question online. Uh, there are two ways. See, what he said was, I know Ed's struggling, but he's creative. So it's okay. I'll show him how creativity can apply to everything that he does. You see, it was one, one teacher that saw the potential over the problem child. There was one teacher who chose restoration over reprimand. And there was one teacher who chose creativity over consequence. And I'll be honest, I've never been the same since. Creativity became my North Star. I got my diploma, Bilang, and I stayed creative. When I was thinking about better ways to use voice and touch in my PhD in user experience and artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a, a picture um, of, like I stayed creative when YouTube started in 2005 when a video of my research went viral. <laughs> I stayed creative as an expert witness on the Apple versus Samsung litigation, uh, even to think about this, this discovery, this research discovery that I had done. And I stayed creative when thinking about teaching AI, uh, to think about what do we really need to teach and how we should teach that AI is, how do, how do we teach that AI is really just power on the internet? Now, this doesn't mean things were easy. I had bully directors who told me that I was too young to be at the decision-making table. I had bully principals who threatened to lock down the school. And I've had bully superintendents who tell me not to talk about racism because I thought we were friends. But I'm no longer afraid of bullies because I have my North Star. 
I know that the most creative decisions come from the most diverse decision-making tables. And I know that if we don't fight for a seat at that table, then our children are going to be the ones that are going to pay for our inaction. And I'm telling you this story not to discourage you about what might happen, but to encourage you. In a world full of bullies, in school and online, be that North Star. It only takes one to change a life. And I'm speaking here today because my grade seven teacher helped me find my creativity. So um, maybe for this time, what I'll do is I have two different things. Like I want to cover some of your questions first, and then afterwards, I want to talk a little bit about those seven secrets, uh, something that I call the uh, AI mindset. Um, and so mindset is an acronym. Uh, so you'll learn about that afterwards. But um, for, the, for the time being, uh, Kara, did you want to um, ask some of the questions? Yes. Um, so let me, I'll give you a few. And I just want to tell the students that even if you don't see the chat, you can Q&A. And so I will approve your questions and give them to Dr. Ed, okay? Um, here's an interesting one. What do you think about AI taking over jobs? What job do you think that AI will take over? Um, I'm really interested. Um, oh, they're asking if they have a mic. Do you think AI should be banned in schools? Uh, and how can you tell if something is AI generated? Mm, these are all really great questions. Okay, the one about jobs, I will cover. I promise I'll cover that when I talk about the mindset. Um, the one about like banning in schools, no, I don't think you should. I absolutely don't think you should um, be banning them in schools because um, the way that I describe the current time that we're in, think of it similar to the Industrial Revolution. So leading up to the Industrial Revolution, we had the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment uh, came just after the bubonic plague killed about a third of Europe. So we had way less people and we had to do way more work. And so we asked the question of, imagine every single job that you do today, we're gonna be asking you to do be 10 times more productive than people are today. So I asked the question, how are you gonna be 10 times more productive without knowing a little bit about AI and without learning a little bit about uh, robotics? I feel like you don't understand those things. You're gonna be in a tough situation. And so that's why I encourage people to learn about it, but understand that it's not what you think it is. It's not like going to give you the answer to every te uh, test. You've got to feed it a lot of truth and you have to be responsible for, is it correct? Is it not correct? That's going to be the hard part, not the just straight up writing part. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll do like uh, a few more, like uh, two or three more, and then and then we'll move on to the, the first few steps and we'll go from there. I'll okay. create some breaks so that we can ask more questions. <laughs> Excellent. They have a lot. Great. So how, how close do you think we are to a true bottom-up AI that thinks like a human? Um, can you simplify proximal policy optimization? Wow. It's very specific. So, um, um, let, go ahead. Let's do the first one about okay. like how close are we to um, what people would call like a general a general purpose AI, um, and I think that this this whole like fear around the general purpose AI, I like from what I can see at least from the experts that it's is much farther away than people at least in the industry are claiming, and part of the reason why people in the industry want to you to be super afraid of, you know, these uh, super, super AIs is because they don't want you focusing on the harm that existing AIs are causing today, right now. And I want you to focus on and understand a little bit more about the harms of today, because those are just going to get magnified. So, and maybe one more? Uh, will there be a day where AI will control us? Is it already does. <laughs> and I'm going to talk a little bit about how it controls you okay. and how you can gain control back. Uh, maybe that's a good transition segue, uh, Kara, into the, the next session. Because um, I talk about like the AI behind your screen. And uh, we often talk to, to students and we kind of expect them, oh, you got to have, you know, good, you know, um, 
positive mindset. Like we expect so much of you guys. We expect you to be the psychologist, you know, to have good uh, mental health. We expect you to be to manage your finances in an increasingly difficult area. And we also expect you to know, like to be a news reporter, to know what is fake news and what is real news. There was that question, like, how do I even know that this is real? And that is going to be a very, very serious problem. And that's one of the reasons why I argue that we need to start adopting an AI mindset. And I want to be very clear. I'm not going to be talking about any technical code. I'm not going to be going through any like technical things. That's not what I think is important for you to know. I think the the secrets that you need to know are all more social studies. The way I would describe it is when I went to school, I thought if you wanted to learn technology, you got to learn math, science, engineering. But when I went to work for industry and I started to see what YouTube was doing, I started to realize, no, I should have paid more attention in social studies. I should have taken a history lesson or two or maybe a politics lesson because in the end, what is AI? AI is just power. It is power on the internet. And power requires that it be hidden, it be invisible, that you are not aware of it. It's like, oh, is AI manipulating us? It's like, absolutely. Are you aware of how it's manipulating you? And if you aren't, then do you really have control over your own choices when all the choices that I control, everything that you see on a screen comes from AI? So mindset is an acronym. The AI mindset uh, is what I'm going to focus on today. And the M for mindset stands for manipulate. Manipulate is the first word. And I think that that's what you really need to understand is that the whole purpose of AI as we use it today is to manipulate you, to control you, to get you to buy things, to get you to uh, engage in certain types of voting behavior. All of these things are very important for you to know. A quote that I usually use is that even if you never you never write a line of code in your entire life. You are training an AI every single time that you use the internet. You need to know it. Coding, you know, we, we they always want you to focus on coding, coding, coding. I'm like, no. If you are if really aware of AI, I can turn your English language stuff into code. You need to know AI. You absolutely must. You either control AI or it controls you. And that is a terrible, terrible way to live. And I don't want you to live that way. The way I would describe this is don't think of this as a new thing. All right. This is not brand new. Think of this as like something super old. Back in the early 1900s, these news outlets did not have to show both sides of the story. They could just show one very, very strong side. There was no obligation to be objective, to show both sides of a, a, a story. And as a result, they had a lot of power. They could decide who was going to be elected. They could decide what people were going to buy. They had that much control over people. And then after two world wars, we kind of made a decision as a society that we don't want to live like this anymore, where we all hate each other. Right. Because we're only in that echo chamber of that newspaper telling us what to think and what to believe. You have to show both sides. And if you look at what is happening with social media, we are back in the early 1900s. Everything that you see online does not have to be both sides. It is very easy for me to just post stuff that is just one point of view. You know, and put you in there and, and amplify just the most angry, like throw you into an echo chamber, amplify only the most angry posts. And I do this not because I, I'm evil or I, I want like, you know, um, like a, a divided society, but because it's good for business. Because in the end, I'm manipulating you to watch more, right? And if watch time gives me more ad revenue, it helps my business, that's what I'm going to do. And so that's why I say, like, when you understand manipulation, you need to understand who, who is trying to manipulate you. Why are they trying to manipulate you? Um, the message I have is that I described AI as power. So 
every AI is trying to optimize for the benefit of its owner. What does its owner want? That's the most important question. What does Mark Zuckerberg want? What does the CEO of Facebook want? What do these very powerful individuals within TikTok want? If they're wanting watch time, you have to understand that, yeah, sometimes we're going to post things that are going to be very like controversial or angry or whatever, because you, you will watch. Jack Dorsey, the uh, co-founder of Twitter, uh, said like you, you drive along a road and then you see a car accident. Well, you look, everybody looks. So an AI sees that and is like, oh, people like car accidents. We need to give them more. And that's, that's what you're going to see. All right. Now, I was just talking about isolation. And I was just talking about echo chambers. But this whole idea of you, don't, I don't need to show you both sides of the story um, is is very prevalent. And so uh, I have this like this this image of an echo chamber um, throwing you into an echo chamber and only amplifying the most angry posts. And think about like what that does to you, what that does to our society. Think about it uh, from that perspective, because I think that that's what you're going to have to understand is that we are not all that different in terms of our perspectives, but you will find that it feels very extreme if you're if you're in one or the other. Uh, and it's going to be very hard to get out of that because sometimes we see stuff on the internet. We're like, oh, it must be, it must be true. But why? Why, why are we so prone to these uh, echo chambers? Because like we're, we're constantly being, we're constantly looking for some type of validation, right? Like that what we're, that our perspective is, is the right one, right? We're always looking, oh yeah, that's got to be the case. Um, one example I, I love is um, conspiracy theories, right? Conspiracy theories are great because um, they help, they're kind of like um, very similar to certain types of drugs. They help you deal with a very difficult world. Um, and they make you feel like, oh, I have like superior intelligence uh, or I have superior knowledge to other people. Uh, but in the end, right, like if we actually look at the, the science of how many like people would need to be manipulated in order for these things to be true, we start to realize, wow, like, why are people doing this? And what was the point of that? Maybe it makes a lot of people feel better. But again, we're not doing this like for nefarious reasons. Like there are reasons why we're doing this. I think now might be a good time. Like, let's let's add in a few more questions, Kara. Do you want to um, ask a few that you've got? I do. I was just writing, so I don't forget. Um, first one, what education is needed for AI? Like for a career in AI, I think. Um. <laughs> So like I had said earlier, um, I talked about like needing to learn like science, engineering, mathematics, uh, but I'm feeling less and less like that now. Like now I'm feeling more um, like learn a little bit more about like history and social studies because that's kind of how it works generally. Uh, and I did have a question before of like, oh, what programming languages do I need to learn in order to learn AI? Do I need to study Python? Do I need to you know, learn more about JavaScript? Uh, those kind of things. And my response was, how is your Mandarin? Because uh, a lot of the world's AI is being written in a language that you may not be familiar with. And the reality is AI is not a game of knowing how to code. It is a game of knowing the data. And the, in this game, the people who have more data tend to win. And so if we're talking about the data of the United States and all the data that it has compared to the data that China has, like China's going to catch up really, really quickly and they might win long term because they have the data. Uh, and so that would be my encouragement is go learn Mandarin <laughs> uh, in terms of your education. It seems kind of surprising, but no, it's like it is very important to understand that they are not like they are not. Um, they're one of the countries that is most aware of what's happening with AI. And here's what I will tell you. Those countries that know a lot about AI, they got very strict rules. 
All right. So social media, there is no social media from 10 a.m. all the way to 6 a.m. The Cinderella rules. They also have rules of they're teaching AI from kindergarten up to grade 12. So these kids, by the time that they graduate, are going to be like world experts in in the fields of AI. Video games, there's no video. Like you want to play Minecraft every day? No, they, they, they allow it like three hours or something on the weekend. That's it. Why? Because these countries, um, like countries like China, understand that, that these things cause mental health issues. They cause all sorts of like hospitalizations. They don't want to pay for it. And that's the thing that you need to recognize is that you and your parents and everyone here is subsidizing big tech companies. We pay for all the mental health issues. We pay for um, every kind of hospitalization, those types of things. We pay for that directly through our taxes. And the, the big tech companies, they pay nothing, right? They create all these problems, but we, they don't have to pay for it. And so at some point, we as a society need to go back and say like, hey, that's not fair. We shouldn't be paying for that. So um, another question, please. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's, I'll add to what AI is most powerful currently and why, or what about chat G GPT? It seems to only be good. So those are maybe, can you wrap those? Yeah. Two? Okay. So um, a few things. So most powerful, like I would argue most powerful for what? And I would say, look at, so when you're looking at AI, don't look at like, oh, which one's more powerful, can do more data. Look at the data that it's trained on. Because knowing AI is not about knowing how to code. It's about knowing what is its original data set. And we're talking about ChatGPT. And so you wonder, well, you know, I saw a ChatGPT and it gave a lie. Why did it give a lie? Well, because the answer isn't in the data set. That's the key. It's not thinking, right? It's, it's pulling an answer from its existing data set. And so you're wondering, like, hmm, where does this data come from? Well, you know, what percentage of... Um, chat GPT's data do you think comes from verified sources like at least editable ones like Wikipedia is it like 30 percent 20 percent 10 percent it's three three percent 40 percent of the data inside chat GPT is comments on reddit and so you wonder, wow, it sounds so good and it works so well and you're like it tells all these lies why hmm? because of the data that it's trained on. Keep in mind that ChatGPT is an engine for fluency. It's designed to make it sound like a real person. It is not an engine for facts. So when you type in a small amount of text and you expect it to produce something that is factual, you'll find that it's not trained for that. It is trying specifically to pull from its data, right? And its data is not always the truth. And so that's why you have to bring the truth, right? So if you give it like a Wikipedia article and you go, give me the 10 most points, that's awesome. It'll do that really well. Think of it more like Google Translate. Um, so in Google Translate, it's designed to go translate from one language to another. Well, what's the difference between one language and another and like this text and then make a summary? It does that really, really well. Um, and the same is for images, right? What images is it trained on, right? You can, you can train mid-journey for certain things. And that's what you're going to start seeing is more specialized AI that's going to work uh, for certain areas because it has more data. And in the end, I ask like not which one's most powerful, but which one has the data set that most matches what I want to produce. Uh, maybe one more. <laughs> okay, this one. Um, what do you think the most wanted job will be in five to 10 years related to technology? A most wanted job uh, related to technology. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't really know what's going to be the, the most wanted. Uh, but what I can do is I can go back to the statistics of all, um, like, let's say, globe ending, <laughs> like world ending type of careers. Um, Anti-nuclear proliferation, poverty, uh, disease. There, there are all of these people working in those areas. And you know the one area that seems to have the least um, amount of investment in terms of people uh, is specifically uh, what we call like uh, alignment, AI alignment. So that is making sure that the interests of the AI is in alignment with the interests of people you know, in a larger scale. 
And I know this because many of the colleagues that I, I worked with, they were in AI ethics at companies like Google, like Amazon, like Facebook, and they all were let go. They were all like the first people to be let go. Uh, because in the end, AI ethics is against the um, is against the profit incentives of companies. And so there will always be a conflict. And I feel like in Canada, it is going to be hard for us to compete with big AI systems from the United States and from China. But, but if you look at many of the most successful companies right here in Calgary or in Alberta, many of them are related to social good, using technology for social good. So we've got Benevity, we've got, uh, which helps with corporate social responsibility. We've got Neo Financial, which helps with uh, the, like, basically loyalty cards are a scam. And so it helps with dealing with the loyalty card issue. And so they may, those may be good systems, but they won't trust them. But they will trust Canada. They will trust, they won't trust China. They won't trust the United States in order to bring ethical AI, they will trust Canada. And I think that that's in the companies who realize that social good is where we can win long term. I think those people are going to be uh, very successful. And so that would be my encouragement is consider the field. It is wildly undersubscribed and there's not a lot of people working in it because it works against the interests of most big tech companies. So, all right, I'm going to, um, move on to the next one, which is this idea of navigate. So the next uh, word that I have is, how do you navigate all of these different echo chambers? And I think that this is important because essentially keep in mind that AI is always trying to personalize your online experience, right? So, and that can sometimes lead you astray uh, and it can you need to learn how to navigate these invisible like barriers so that you can explore a wider kind of more diverse world. And the way that I've described this navigation is not a, oh, I go to a destination. No, the metaphor that I want you to think about when it comes to navigation is an anchor. Think of like a giant ship and you've got to anchor yourself somewhere because this is the concern I have is that every single day, if what you're watching isn't your, your parents' point of view, uh, isn't like the, the views from you know, um, the faith that you might have, it's from the influencer, that individual who is blessed by the algorithm, who is able to live an extraordinary life that is beyond reality for most people, you're gonna be pretty choked or pretty upset when you realize they're not as nice people as you think that they are. And I think that that's the way I see it is our world is constantly like changing and shifting and everybody's trying to like manipulate you for some reason. Where's your anchor? What do you rely on when everything else is falling apart? And I'm hoping that it's not on an influencer, even though that influencer, like it may be sounds like they're speaking the truth and maybe they're helping you out a lot, but you need, you need to have a strong foundation. You need to have an anchor somewhere. And so when I say navigate, it's like, yes, people are going to say these things in this echo chamber. I won't know. I won't know if like, how do I know if something is GPT is generated by chat GPT, like the fake news thing that we talked about earlier. Well, now it's pretty easy, right? Like there's things you can look for, like the six fingers, <laughs> or you can, you can, like it was pretty obvious before, but as this stuff gets better, it will be harder and harder. It'll be harder and harder. And then it will, the question will be, what are your values? What do you know? Like, what do you know is truth? And what are the, the differing opinions that you're willing to allow in your own feeds? Are you going to go down like one rabbit hole of that most extreme? Like there are people who just extreme... Uh, consume uh, conspiracy theories only, right? And so those that's what your, your worldview is going to be like. And the way that I would describe this is when I think about navigating the echo chambers, I want you to think about the most famous people. The most famous people, like people who are famous for, they're su wildly successful, maybe in tech, but they're also wildly famous for making very few decisions. Now, this is really important. So you've got Steve Jobs. He's always wearing the same clothes. 
You've got Warren Buffett. He's always eating the same stuff for lunch. You have Jeff Bezos saying, oh, like I need my sleep. These people are famous for reducing the number of decisions that they have to make because they know that all decisions, like every decision that you make requires energy. It requires focus. It requires attention. But then we are exposed to this world of social media where every single social media post has multiple decisions. Do I keep watching this post? Do I like it? Comment? Do I go to the next one? Do I buy what they're, do I believe their perspective? Think about in a single day, just scrolling through social media, how many decisions you've had to go through, how much energy, how much brain power you've had to use in order to just navigate your own social media feed and ask the question like, great. So how many, how many, how much energy do I have to make decisions about my career? How much energy do I have to make decisions about where, uh, am I going to buy my first house? Am I going to get my first car? No, we're not going to have that. And so I see this as think about your life. Think about all the decisions that you are making in a given day and ask yourself, what is one less decision that I can make today? One less decision or one less thing that I need to, to worry about. Because we are... And, and I see this in a lot of schools too, you know, like um, in the school that my kids go to, 60% are saying that they're overwhelmed, they have a lot of anxiety, um, and they're depressed related to what they see online. And the way I would describe this for you is overwhelmed, overwhelmed with what? What we are overwhelmed with a lot of the time is choice. So in back in the day, like you, you'll see these videos, right? Like this, this, I went to a school in uh, Uganda, you know, and we we're helping rebuild the St. Anne school. And I spoke to people there. I'm like, I do not get it. Like to the, I spoke to the head teacher. It's like, well, I don't get it. Like, how are you guys so happy? You guys have nothing. And she said, you're absolutely right. We, we don't have any, we don't have any money to like plan for the t tomorrow. We, we, you know, like we barely have enough for today. Um, and so really the only choice that we have is do I be happy or do I be sad about it? That is the only choice that they have. And they're like, I chose to be happy today. And this is what you're going to find in your own lives as well, is that every time you go up in, in income, your number of possibilities increases exponentially. And as you keep going up and up in, in life, if you have more and more income, the number of possibilities just becomes very overwhelming. And this is why you find many people who are um, extremely wealthy are also extremely depressed, extremely sad, because their number of possibilities is exponentially more. And I, I see that as... It is hard, right? And this was the whole idea behind creativity is that creativity is an, a ton of possibilities and your ability to just focus on one and, and really dive deep on that, that is really your, your formula for success. And I worry about schools, if they're not focused enough on creativity, giving you many, many choices, then you have to choose one. How are you going to handle social media where you've got an infinite number of choices and you have to choose just one, right? Of what you're going to, how you're going to spend your time. So decisions that you have to make, that's what I mean by navigating. It's not exposing more, but knowing where you need to stay. Okay. Um, maybe I'll do one more. So this one is uh, what I would call digital soul. So uh, I want you to learn about, you know, we talk about data, data privacy, your personal information, um, and they're like, oh, you know, we're storing a lot of personal information. I don't want you to think of your data as your personal information. That's kind of like a, a too abstract uh, a way of describing it. I want you to think of it as your digital soul. It is like it used to be the case that I had to record uh, likes and comments and, you know, like your, your feedback. But nowadays, I don't need any of that stuff to know exactly who you are. You just 
watch a few different things on TikTok, and those milliseconds of watch time immediately tell me who you are, what it like, what are your political preferences? What are the kinds of things that you're going to buy? What are the kinds of videos that are going to manipulate you? I know so much about you from that data, and so you have to understand that what you're giving them is your 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 deepest desires. I say like your parents might not be watching. When you're using the internet, but I can assure you that an AI is watching all the time, and they know exactly what you want. Like you want to know about somebody, go and look at their for you page on YouTube. You'll you'll know exactly what that person likes. I think every teacher should like give me a screenshot of your your for you page, and then you would immediately know the interests of like every student within your class. It's it's that it's that detailed, and so I think. There are some countries like the European Union where they are、um, recognizing that they have no control over anything. Like they don't control Google or any of the social media that people use in their regions, and so they're they're saying, "What can we control?" It's like our data. So we can say we can build these new laws to say you need to have permission in order to use our citizens' data, and then they can go even further to implement AI acts to require certain things to、uh, be checked. We don't have that here. We don't have that here in Canada, and even the politicians I've spoken to are like, "We can't do anything." Like, we try to do a simple change, like Bill C thirty one, to regulate, like get more Canadian content. And you know what YouTube does? They run millions of dollars of ads against our own politicians. They say, "We're going to get rid of you in the next election." That's how much power they have. And so we have to understand that, like, we need to to treat our data. And if you don't trust that company with your digital soul, <laughs> don't give it to them. And so that's really what you have. Like this is、um, like these big data companies will call your data the new oil, but think of it like your data is your vote. You know, for these systems. So just don't give them your vote. Don't give them your data.、Um, that's really the the thing that you can really do to fight them. Starve their <laughs> AI systems.、Um, yeah. So maybe now is a good time to、uh, have some more questions, Kara. Go ahead. Okay, I have a, a couple, but I do want to know we passed the ten minutes, so we only have ten minutes. Okay.、Um, tech machines.、Uh, can we teach machines ethics, empathy, and compassion? Yeah, I'm going to come to that question、um, uh, when I get to technology,、okay. emotional control. Yeah. All right, and how can we make money using AI? Basically, like, what kind of careers are there in AI, and how do I get involved in it? What do I need to like? What are my what's my pathway to using AI as a career? Okay, so it when it comes to like AI and careers, don't think of it like I need a career in AI. Think of it more like, no, I have a passion in some area, and I'm going to understand a little bit about AI and in how to apply it. You know, I may have a certain type of art or a certain type of writing, and I'm using it to augment what I'm already doing. So, so move towards your passions. Do not like, don't just do AI for AI's sake. Like I did AI. For AI's sake, and then I suddenly realize, oh my gosh, I have this passion for teaching、uh, people about AI and the politics. And I've noticed I see things differently. Like most people who talk about AI don't talk about it like I do,、uh, because I've been there since the beginning, and I and I kind of see it from a different perspective. So see it from from your passion perspective. I always ask the question not about like what AI do you need to understand. It's like what do you like? What do you really care about? Because you're going to have to dive deep. You're gonna have to build some expertise, and how could AI help that? I think would be a better question to ask. Okay, so given the the、uh, the time, I'm gonna move on to the next one about strategy. And so、uh, this one's normally for the the younger kids. So when I talk about like what's your strategy to rather than being dictated by AI, how do you take strategies to take charge? And I think that this is where some of the questions were leading.、Um, and so who remembers like of course the.、Uh, The AI in the Avengers:、uh, Age of Ultron. You know, he said, "Peace in our time." Right? That was the command, and we we decided, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the AI make the decisions, and then boom, you get Ultron. Right? Like these these are the kinds of things that happen. And now we are saying, in all of our social media feeds on YouTube, on Insta, on、uh, TikTok, on X, we are saying. AI go and make the decisions as to what we should see, and what do you think that leads to? So when I say like 
emotional control, I say, look at all those evil robots that you see in movies. Why are they evil? Is it because they're uh, like they're jealous of people? They're angry? Is it because no? It's because you told them, you trained them. They're doing what you asked them to do. So you go and look at your feeds and you see a lot of negative stuff. It's because you told the computer that you want to see those things. You don't want to see those things, then you have to take control. You have to tell the computer either I don't want to see those. You have to skip through those quickly. You have to mo monitor your own. You have to monitor and manage your own watch time. Because in the end, your attention and, and the brain power required to get your attention is one of the most valuable assets. And you have to be very, very careful about who you give that to. And so in the end, whose job is it to know what is right and what is wrong? It is, like I often ask the, the, the really young kids this, it's your job and it will always be your job. And things go really bad when we start getting AI to make moral decisions. We've already crossed that. We've already crossed into the age of Ultron when it comes to uh, our social media feeds when it comes to our Google searches, we've already accepted that AI will make all of these decisions for us. And I ask, is that the right thing? Is, is, did we make the right decisions there? And that's where uh, we run into problems all the time, is that we have not built in morality. <laughs> that is not something we're training for. Uh, we, we've you know, it, trained it for efficiency. We've trained it for like, you know, at mass scale, what's gonna keep you on the platform. Nothing to do with morals. So just keep that in mind, okay? Um, and then I also want to talk to you about emotions. Emotions are such an important, like your emotional control, because this is, this is one of the key elements is that what we have decided with AI is that we've kind of figured out how to, to get you hooked. Um, and it's through the, um, basically through the endocrine system. So inside your brain, Right, like there are certain elements that are specifically focused on producing things like dopamine, like chemicals like dopamine, and we understand that these tactics and strategies uh, very much are connected to your own feeling of well-being and how, uh, like how good you feel. But keep in mind, this dopamine receptor wasn't meant to be activated all the time. It was meant to really be activated like, oh, I've like, you know, captured the bear or, you know, I've, I've you know, made a big, big accomplishment and you're supposed to be like flooded with it. But what happens if I flood you with it every single day, all the time? Then I ask the question of how much do you think like, how motivated are you going to be to go and do that extra homework assignment, to go and pursue that first career, to go and buy your first car when I'm flooding you with dopamine all the time? And um, it relates to the, that first message that I have is when I talk about like manipulation, like online pornography exists on the internet, I hate to break it to you, to manipulate you. Uh, that's the main reason it exists. And you'll see this in, in a lot of like control mechanisms. Like why do we try to get people to more and more illicit types of pornography, especially the ones that are illegal, because the more illegal that they are, the more control that person can exert on you. And it, it gets to the point where you have no, you, you don't have control over your own life anymore. It literally controls you. And this is a type of um, flooding of like your, your system with dopamine and with chemicals that will impact you for the remainder of your life. Um, and I speak as somebody who has experienced this uh, personally, I do feel like you have to understand it has a, 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 it really is about controlling you through your, through your own endocrine system. And so you need to understand that like, this is, this is important for you to be aware. It exists. It is always there. And it has one purpose and one purpose only to manipulate you, to control you. And so your controlling, so it used to be the case. So how do you, how do we fight back against this? Well, fortunately, um, during the Vietnam War, uh, we had all of these uh, GIs that were addicted to heroin and we were super worried that they were going to come back to the United States and then they were going to uh, still be addicted to heroin. But what we found is that when we took them out of that terrible environment in, in Vietnam and then we moved them into this new environment of the, um, 
uh, they of uh, like America, where their lives were totally different. They they could go back to their families. What we found is that none of the most of them were able to stop cold turkey. Now the problem is like we're in an era where your your phone or your device is with you all the time, right? It is it is constant. It is with you, so it's hard to escape it. So what that means is you have to take time off, like you have to put it in that like we call it a, a tech Sabbath or something. That's tricky, right? Because it, it does feel like you know oh how could we go without it? But in the end, you are with the environment all the time. You have to separate yourself from the environment. is is going to be uh, something that is going to help you get more control back on your own life. Just try it. If you don't believe me, try it. See if it works. If it doesn't work, come back to me for a full refund. <laughs> okay. And then um, the last one I want to cover, um, which I think is also very like people are also often asking technology. And automation, oh my gosh, all these jobs are going to disappear. What are we going to do? Well, uh, I do this one with elevators. And so uh, one of the things that I do for uh, my job is I, I teach like kids to build like little uh, wooden robots. And so this is an example of an elevator. And I ask the question of, well, what happens to jobs when they do get automated? So the example here is, hey, look at this. This is um, like an elevator operator. We used to do all of this manually, and now we can just push a button, right? And then it can go right to the floor. And so the reality is there are still elevator operators today. Uh, you can see this lady in Japan. Um, her job is to ask you, hey, uh, what are you looking for? Oh, uh, I'm looking for a dress. I'm going to a wedding this summer. Oh, then you'd want to really hit uh, floor number seven. There's a great store. It has beautiful dresses that are great for weddings. So, what kind of work is that? That work is not predictable. It's service oriented. It's people oriented, and it's still very important. It's more like marketing. And if you focus on those types of things that are more people oriented. You focus on things that are like less of the oh I need to like technically operate something like that's going to be less and less important. But if we focus on not the things that are predictable that are more human focused, we're always going to need people for those. Uh, and so I like I'm optimistic. Like I'm cautiously optimistic. People are worried about jobs. That the reality is we're an older population, and many people like we have a lot more people leaving the workforce than we have entering. And so that's that's why I talk about like this need to be way more productive in whatever you do, uh, and that's why I say like I'm I'm not worried at all. I mean, if Amazon could figure out like a little robot to go and like stuff things into boxes, they would have done that like years ago. Like it's worth billions to them. But the reality is like there are certain things that are still really really hard uh, to do, and so. We think of it like, oh, this like artificial intelligence. It's actually one of the reasons why, for myself, um, I often use uh, a lowercase i because I think the intelligence is way overrated. <laughs>、um, and so this is the AI mindset: manipulate, isolate, navigate your digital soul,、um, the strategies,、uh, emotion control, and tech automation. Those are the the, diff the seven different areas.、Uh, and so. If you want to learn a little bit more about me, you can go to aiparenting.live, or you can search AI Parenting on your social medias.、Uh, and like, like I said, this is kind of what I do: is like I have like build a bot programs, and I have like little courses、uh, to teach people about AI. And so, with that, I'll leave any time left for questions if we have any. <laughs> No, I do think that we our session was supposed to end at nine fifty five, and my our students are supposed to be heading to a reflection、okay. session. But、uh, Dr. Ed, this was a great session. I really enjoyed it, and I know I can tell by the amount of questions I still have in my feed that we could have kept going. So, well, any questions that you guys have, like I can also answer afterwards. But like,、yeah. maybe give me the your the great question that you that you had seen. Um, I, I is it possible that competition in the AI field will bring about a revolution in GPU comp computing power? I, I mean, sure. Just look at、um, Nvidia stock price; it's already like up the roof.、Um, and so, yeah, like computing power is going to is going to compensate. But I would say, like, when I went to school,、um, we had those WAP phones, like those little flip phones and stuff. And then I thought, oh, this is so cool! This is so amazing! And my professor、um, in user experience, he told me, like, why are you you working on these like really cheap, you know, phones of today? 
uh, he said, like, why don't you just like use an existing computer and assume that you know, eventually the phones will have as much computing power as as the computer these days. Just work on those. And, I, and it kind of helped me learn that it's like, don't let the current state of technology limit your creativity because people often do. They go, oh, it's just not possible today. It's like, you're, you're too worried about today. Uh, things keep improving according to Moore's law. Uh, so we, we have a lot less to worry about in terms of compute and, and, and that type of revolution. So the revolution has been happening for the last 20 years. Excellent. I will um, approve some of these questions in case like we can ever come back to them after. But we are at the, at the time period where we, we have to go. But I will say one more time. Thank you, Dr. Ed. This was a very enlightening. I hope everyone uh, will go visit your site. <laughs> Thank you. And I really appreciate your yeah, the posting those questions. And thank you so much for your time. And I will try to get to your questions. <laughs> All right. I will as prove as much as I can. Um, and I think I'll have to end the call. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attendance and your um, attention. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.